I want to uh, welcome, please uh, give Dr. Bio from the Department of Marie Bio from the Department of Surgery a warm welcome. She will be presenting uh, her poster, Detection of Hypoxia in Human Thoracic Aorta Using P. Monidazole, ACI. Uh, Dr. Bio, you'll have nine minutes to present and four minutes for Q&A. Please begin. All right, so can everyone see my screen um, and hear me okay? All right. Yes. Thank you very much, Tiffany, for um, the introduction. Um, so welcome, everyone. Uh, I want to start by thanking uh, the Brigham Research Institute for this award. It's a real honor to present today. Um, so as Tiffany said, I will uh, talk today about uh, human thoracic aorta and a way to um, uh, detect uh, hypoxia in this disease. So, so we're all on the same page. Um, I am presenting this first slide uh, with a description of what are ascending aortic uh, aneurysm. So ascending aortic aneurysm are uh, a type of ascending aortic diseases. So as you can see on this graph on the top left here, um, aneurysm um, arise in the ascending aorta. So those are the type of aneurysm that our lab is interested in. Um, as you can imagine, because they arise right outside of the heart, they are um, uh, they can have terrible consequences. Uh, here on uh, this three D, uh, so, excuse me, in this three D reconstruction of a CT scan, you can see here a bulge of the ascending aorta, uh, which is uh, the definition of an aneurysm. Aneurysm have a, a, a excuse me, have, um, uh, can be complicated by, a and, and ev uh, oh, excuse me, <laughs> and evolve into a dissection, which you can see here. This is the surgical view, uh, the surgeon's view of a dissection. So what happens is that the aneurysm uh, grows and grows and grows and uh, ended up dissecting, which can lead to rupture. So this dissection um, is the 15th leading cause of death. And in 20% uh, of the case, uh, they have a known cause, which is mostly genetic. But in 80% of the cases, there is no known cause. So it's definitely um, of clinical importance. Um, so currently, the surgical, um, excuse me, currently the only treatment is surgical aortic replacement. So in our uh, division of cardiac surgery, um, many times a week, we see patients that have an ascending aortic aneurysm and what happens is that the surgeon will resect this portion of the ascending aortic aneurysm and will replace it with a graft. And just to give you an idea, this is not a small procedure. On the bottom right here, you can see a surgeon's view again of the surgery. Um, it is a very, very invasive procedure, open heart procedure, as you can imagine. So it is not without risk. Um, so the problem uh, currently with um, this surgery is that the surgical guideline um, recommends surgical intervention when the ascending aorta uh, reaches a diameter of 5.5 centimeter. And just to give you an idea, um, the, uh, a normal ascending aorta is around two or three centimeter. Um, however, if you look at this study here, you can see that the mean dissection diameter uh, is at 5.31 centimeter. So we have a surgical intervention threshold that is actually above the mean diameter at time of dissection. So there is constantly this um, um, ambivalence, I wanna say, uh, for surgeons, they, they have to decide whether a patient with an ascending aortic aneurysm is more at risk of dissection or if um, the surgical rich risks, excuse me, themselves um, are higher than this risk of dissection. So the objective of our lab as a whole is to develop new diagnostic tools to assess this, this risk of aortic dissections. So to understand a little bit about the disease, um, I pull up this, um, this two cartoons. Um, so, yeah, uh, these this three cartoons uh, to understand a little bit about the pathophysiology of ascending aortic aneurysm. So on the left here, you have um, a schematic depicting um, the structure of the aorta. So the aorta has mainly three layers with an intima, a media made of smooth muscle cells, and an, um, an adventitia or the tunica externa here. 
Uh, what you're looking at here um, are smooth muscle cells. So we're talking about this uh, Tunica media here. Um, the smooth muscle cells here that are trapped between layers of extracellular matrix, mostly made of elastin and collagen. What happened in the aneurysmal aorta is that these elastin and collagen uh, are degraded and the smooth muscle cells are not entrapped in this nice and tight extracellular matrix and they end up dying by um, anuichus. So if we focus on the adventitia, uh, the adventitia is a very interesting um, uh, structure because it is mostly connective tissue, but it also has what we call vasovisorum, which are these small vessels that surround the aorta. And their role is to provide nutrient and oxygen to the outer layers of aorta. And so one of our first um, observation was that um, non-aneurysmal, in non-aneurysmal um, cross-section of aorta, you can see these nice small vessels here in the adventitia. But in an aneurysmal cross-section, aneurysmal aortic cross-section, you can see large, um, large vasovisorum, but also much less vasovisorum. So I'm not going to get too much into the quantification of, uh, or into the analysis of everything we did here, but the, 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 the take home message is that we quantified and analyzed in depth these uh, vasovisorum, and we found that there are less vasovisorum in aneurysmal aorta, which led us to hypothesize that there is possibly uh, hypoxia or low oxygen in uh, the aorta, in, in ascending aortic aneurysm. So to do this, we uh, performed immunofluorescence to detect a marker of chronic hypoxia. In our case here, we, we, um, we detected GLUT1, which is a glucose transporter. Um, and so what happens is that um, under low oxygen, cells change their metabolism from an oxidative um, metabolism to uh, a, a metabolism using more glucose. So cells need to express more glucose transporter um, to get more glucose into the cells. So what you're looking at here are cross sections of um, aortic, of aorta, excuse me, from a patient with a, with a normal valve and patient with an abnormal valve, which are actually more at risk of uh, developing an aneurysm. And on the left here, you have an uh, example of two patients, non-aneurysmal, two more non-aneurysmal with a BV, and um, aneurysmal to the right. Uh, so you can clearly see that... Um, One minute reminder, Dr. Beal. Thank you. You can clearly see that uh, the aneurysmal patient have much more uh, good one expression. So we ended up um, starting a clinical trial using uh, pimonidazole HCL, or the otherwise called hypoxyprobe. The way it worked was that patient would take pimonidazole in the morning of the surgery. This compound would bind to cells with low PO2, and then after resection of the tissue fixation um, and, and bringing it to the lab, we would detect this, uh, this drug in uh, the tissue using immunofluorescence again. So here you can see uh, on the top right, this is a control aorta. There is very little um, uh, red staining, so meaning there is li very little lipoxyprobe bind in this area. And then here on the left, you can see uh, an aneurysmal area of the aorta, which has much more uh, hypoxic area. So this is very promising. And so in the future, what we want to do is uh, use another compound that is actually a PET radio tracer uh, called f -miso, uh, which is actually currently used in cancer to detect hypoxic areas. So we hope that we can use this uh, PET radio tracer uh, to detect hypoxia non-invasively uh, in human aortic aneurysm. And so I want to finish by acknowledging um, our, uh, the people involved in the work and uh, express our gratitude for patients and their family for giving us their tissue for research. Thank you very much. Oh, fantastic. And so now we open up uh, for questions and for, we have a few minutes, about three minutes for questions and attendees can put the questions either in the chat or you can raise your hand and I can 
uh, unmute you. So, and you know, the conversation does not end here. That's the great part, Discover Brigham. We can continue the conversation at the Discover Brigham website and, and also Dr. Bio and all the other research award winners have their posters available where you can see the beautiful posters and abstracts to their research. Oh, we have a question in the chat, Dr. Bio. Okay, somebody is asking if uh, aortic aneurysm is mainly driven by genetics. Um, so in certain cases, yes, definitely. There are some uh, genetic diseases that predispose for aortic aneurysm. One that you may have heard of is called Marfan syndrome. Um, it's a disease where um, there's a genetic, uh, excuse me, uh, a mutation in the gene of uh, an extracellular matrix protein or a gene coding for an extracellular matrix protein. Uh, and what happens in that case is that, um, I don't know if you, I'm just gonna bring up, excuse me, a slide if I can. Yeah, this slide actually, of course. Okay, so, um, if you, if you look here on this uh, schematic here, you have um, these little fibrils here that uh, keep the cells together in a nice extracellular matrix. Uh, Marfan syndrome is actually um, caused by a genetic mutation of the fibrin one. So what happens is that the extracellular matrix in these patients is very loose um, and they're more at risk of ascending aortic aneurysm. There was a follow-up question about donor selection. Oh, great. Okay, I think you had to miss that. Um, so, um, I'm not entirely sure what is meant by donor, but I will um, interpret that those are the patients we get tissue from. Uh, so, those are flagged uh, during sur uh, before surgery when they are in clinic um, in the clinic with our surgeons. Um, where you know it's it's the pre-surgery um, visit, um, and so we basically get tissue from everything we can. So of course patients are informed uh, of the process and consented, uh, but we get uh, all sorts of um, ascending aortic aneurysm, including those that are driven by genetics. All right, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Dr. Bio for presenting your poster. Uh, and I'm going to ask you to stop sharing. Mm -hmm. And then we are going to welcome our next poster winner, Dr. Lila Grant. I apologize, Dr. Lila Grant. That's correct, thank you. <laughs> yeah, all right, and we'll spotlight your video for you. And Dr. Lila Grant is from the Division of Sleep and Circadian Disorders in Department of Medicine who will be presenting on effect of sleep interruption with leuprolide induced hypoestrogenism on fasting nutrient utilization in premenopausal women. And again, it'll be a nine minute presentation followed by four minutes of Q&A. Okay, thank you so much, Tiffany. Um, and thanks also to Discover Brigham for the invitation to present some of the work that we've been doing. So menopause is a reproductive transition and it's experienced by all women, typically in their late 40s um, or during their 50s. And it's around this time of menopause that we start to see rates of obesity increase in women. So we know that obesity increases our risk for serious diseases like heart disease and diabetes. So it's important that we can understand some of the factors that might be contributing to menopause-related weight gain in order for us to develop effective interventions. So there are several factors that might contribute to weight gain during menopause, but in our study, we were interested specifically in two, which are changes in hormone levels and changes in sleep. So estrogen withdrawal, estrogen being the primary female sex hormone, is really a hallmark of menopause, um, but it can come along with a number of symptoms. And the most common um, that we see are hot flashes. So a hot flash is a uh, transient feeling of um, heat that's usually experienced in the face, neck and chest. And when these occur at night, they can wake somebody up from sleep and ultimately lead to quite significant sleep disruption. We know from previous research that changes in hormone levels and changes in sleep can lead to changes in our metabolism that might promote weight gain. 
So in our study, we were interested in whether we could use um, experimental models of the type of sleep and hormone changes that occur during menopause to see how these will affect metabolic factors that might be contributing to weight gain in this population. So the study that we conducted had two study visits, but I'll start first by walking you through study visit one. So we studied 21 healthy um, premenopausal women in a five-night study. So for the first two nights of the study, sleep was normal or uninterrupted, but then this was followed by three nights of sleep fragmentation. And you can see that we conducted a metabolic assessment, and I'll explain what that is in a little bit more detail in a moment. But we basically did this at the start of the study after normal sleep, and then again at the end of the study after fragmented sleep. So for the sleep fragmentation, the way that we did this was to use an auditory stimulus, um, which means that we just played a really loud noise that woke the participants up, and that happened every 15 minutes. And then once they were awake, we kept them awake for two minutes, and so over the course of the night, this led to um, just over an hour of extra wakefulness. So on normal nights of sleep, you can see that we gave participants an eight-hour opportunity to sleep, whereas on fragmented nights, we actually gave them an extra hour in bed. And this is really to account for that extra hour of wakefulness that our fragmentation protocol was able to achieve. So if we look here, um, this is PSG recorded um, wakefulness during sleep. And you can see that compared to um, unfragmented nights, which is the open box here, during fragmentation, we were able to increase that wakefulness by around an hour. What our study didn't change though was total sleep time. So the sleep duration between the two conditions was identical. Um, and this was really by design because what we're trying to do here is mimic the type of sleep disruption that we most commonly see in menopause. So the difference, as I said earlier, we had two study visits and really the difference between these study visits has to do with the estrogen levels that they were conducted under. So visit one, which I just explained, was conducted um, in a high estrogen condition. So this blue line is um, roughly depicting sort of what, the, what estrogen looks like over the course of a typical monthly menstrual cycle. And so we scheduled this first visit to occur uh, when estrogen levels are naturally at their highest. In a subset of the participants that did this first visit, we then brought them back and to those we administered a drug that's called Luprolide. And so Luprolide acts to temporarily suppress estrogen levels. And if we look at estrogen levels um, before and then after Luprolide, you can see that the drug acted to, on average, suppress or reduce estrogen levels by about 70%. And so it's in this low estrogen state that we then conducted our second visit, and that was identical to the first visit. Um, so we had two nights of normal sleep followed by three nights of fragmented sleep with a metabolic assessment at the start and at the end. So the metabolic assessment that we did is called indirect calorimetry, and this works by measuring um, the amount of oxygen that somebody's breathing in relative to the amount of carbon dioxide that they breathe out. And we assess this over about 20 minutes. And um, indirect calorimetry can really uh, look at two main aspects of our metabolism, and that's the amount of energy that we're using or expending, and also which nutrients our body is using to create that energy. So in order to maintain our weight, we really need to create a balancing act between um, the energy that's coming in, which is really from the food that we're eating, compared to the energy that we're expending. And quite a large proportion of energy out can really be captured by what's called the resting energy expenditure. And this is something that we're measuring when we do uh, calorimetry. So if we were to create the imbalance in this scale, for example, by changing um, the amount of energy in, which we didn't do in our study, um, or if the energy out were to change, this could lead to changes in weight. Under circumstances though, where we don't have a change in energy balance, we might also gain weight if the body changes which nutrients it's using to produce energy. So under normal conditions, the body will burn carbohydrates and fats as primary fuel sources. Um, and we can get an indication of the proportion of carbohydrates or fats being used for energy by measuring something called the respiratory quotient. And this is something else that we're measuring when we do calorimetry. So you can imagine that um, if the body were to start suddenly burning less fat, that over time um, we might accumulate or store that fat, and that would then lead to weight gain. So for our results, I'm going to start by first talking about the effect of sleep fragmentation. So these data here are all from our first study visit that was in the high estrogen condition. So the black box is showing you the calorimetry response um, after normal unfragmented sleep, whereas the hatch box is showing the response after fragmented sleep. 
So if we start by looking at the respiratory quotient, just to sort of explain to you what these values mean, essentially as these values get higher, it means that the body is deriving a larger proportion of its energy from burning carbohydrates, um, which then of course means that we're burning less fat. And so in response to our sleep fragmentation, what we saw was an increase here, which indicates that there was a greater utilization of carbohydrates. And along with um, this change in nutrient utilization, we might also expect that the rate of oxidation or the rate of breakdown of these nutrients would also be different. And that is indeed what we see. So we see an increase in the rate of breakdown of carbohydrates and a decrease in the rate of breakdown of fats. What we didn't see, though, was any change in energy expenditure. So now if we look at the effects of estrogen withdrawal, so this black box again is showing you um, the effects or, or the colorimetry outcome after normal sleep in the high estrogen condition, whereas the blue box is showing the effect of normal sleep in the low estrogen condition. So this is really isolating our estrogen withdrawal effect. And what we see here is the same response um, that we saw after the sleep fragmentation. So we get an increase in utilization of carbohydrates and a decrease in utilization of fats again with no change in um, energy expenditure. Okay, so what happens when we combine our two interventions? So this final box in each of these um, panels is showing you uh, sleep fragmentation in the low estrogen condition. So because we saw that sleep fragmentation and estrogen withdrawal both led to the same response, we might expect that when we combine these two interventions that we would get an even greater or even stronger response. Um, but that's actually not what we saw here, which indicates to us really that there was no additive effect, meaning that um, the two interventions together did not produce a greater effect than either intervention on its own. Okay, so what One does minute, all of Dr. this mean? Grant. Thank you. <laughs> so what does all of this mean? Um, so essentially what we found in our study is that um, if we disrupt somebody's sleep with our, our sleep fragmentation protocol, or if we simulate menopause, which we did by suppressing estrogen using lupralide, um, we saw that the women in this study burned more carbohydrates and burned less fat. And so um, if this were to happen, we would expect over time that this to ultimately um, would lead to weight gain. And so our findings are important um, really for understanding some of the mechanisms that might be underlying menopause-related weight gain. Um, and it also helps us to identify modifiable risk factors or areas for intervention. Um, so I'd like to acknowledge the huge team um, of researchers and research assistants. Um, this takes a lot of people to get this sort of work done. Um, so thank you to everybody and also thank you to the funding agency. Yeah, that's great. And it really is a, a research community, really is that a community would come together and fantastic research that you have presented for us. And so now I'd like to open it up for questions for Dr. Grant. Uh, again, uh, attendees can uh, put questions in the chat or you can raise a hand and I will unmute you. Mm -hmm. oh, Dr. Grant, we got a question for you from Dr. Jaffe. So do we know if the sleep mechanism affects men too? Yes, we do, actually. Um, so there is a paper, it's, it's slightly different in terms of the fragmentation, um, but basically they fragmented sleep every hour. Um, so I think it was more a model of sleep apnea rather than the type of fragmentation happening um, with menopause. But they showed the exact same results. So there was an increase in um, the respiratory quotient and also um, an increase in carbohydrate oxidation with a decrease in fat oxidation. And interestingly, they also showed no effect um, on energy expenditure. So that's nice that it was <laughs> at least consistent with something that's already been published. But it's also interesting in the context of potentially sex differences in these responses. There's another question for you, Dr. Grant. Um, so is estrogen and sleep regulated by the same mechanism? Um, in terms of menopause, in, in the context of menopause. Um, so they're, they're somewhat intertwined in that um, menopause is of course associated with um, a reduction in estrogen um, across the board. And in some women we see that they develop um, insomnia symptoms, so sleep disturbances. 
And in, in quite a large proportion of um, the women that develop these sleep problems, it tends to be driven by hot flashes. Um, and so that is directly linked to the, the estrogen withdrawal. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Seems like it may have. <laughs> oh, Laura's asking a question. Okay. Yeah. So why do you think that you don't see a synergistic effect? Um, that's a really great question. And um, I don't know that we yet know the answer to that. So one um, potential explanation is that under this, um, under these, so the colorimetry was conducted in the fasted state um, and, and we maintained the same diet throughout the entire study um, and so it's possible that under those circumstances with that diet we're kind of um, at, at a specific uh, a range of responses and so we, what we might be seeing is a ceiling effect or a floor effect um, but I think really the, the honest answer to that question is we don't know yet. <laughs> more research to be done right? Correct always more research to be done. <laughs> and on that note I want to conclude the Q&A portion and thank you so much, Dr. Grant, for presenting your poster. And so now, oh, thank I, you. yeah, absolutely. And so now, yeah, you start sharing and I want to welcome, let me spotlight, I want to welcome our next poster winner, Dr. Jessica Harder from the Department of Psychiatry, who will be presenting on brain-derived neuro trophic factor and mood in perimenopausal depression. I, I should have, I should have, I meant to apologize in advance to our attendees if I, if I mispronounced anything. I hope you can forgive me. Uh, but the research is still amazing, even if I mess up the titles. So again, and then Dr. Harder will have nine minutes to present and four minutes for a Q and A. You pronounced it perfectly. Thank uh, you. Thank you for the introduction. Good morning, I'm Jessica Harder. Um, I'm going to talk to you about BDNF and mood in perimenopausal depression. Um, I just wanted to start out by saying thank you to Discover Brigham for the opportunity to present. This study was funded by a Livingston Fellowship from the Harvard Medical School, um, and the parent study was funded by an NIH grant to Dr. Jaffe. The Harvard Catalyst also provided funding for the biostatistical consultation for this project. And I've also had some uh, support from the Department of Psychiatry at BWH, for which I'm very grateful. Okay, so let's see. So depression is a disorder that entails low mood, um, decreased interest in or ability to enjoy things and negative thinking amongst other symptoms. Most depression in women does not have to do with changes in hormones, but reproductive subtypes of depression appear to occur in response to fluctuations in the female sex steroid hormones, estradiol and progesterone. These hormonally sensitive depressions include premenstrual dysphoric disorder or PMDD, in which mood is low just prior to menstruation, postpartum depression, in which mood is low after delivery, and perimenopausal depression, in which mood is low during the transitional period of hormonal fluctuation and irregular menses. In women with premenstrual mood symptoms, elevated inflammatory biomarkers are also associated with mood symptoms in the perimenstrual period. Brain-derived neurotrophic factor is involved in brain synapse and, uh, formation and plasticity. This means that it helps to support the survival of existing neurons, and it also encourages the growth of new neurons and the connections between neurons. While we can measure it in the blood, it tells us something about what's going on in the brain. In non-reproductive major depressive disorder, higher BDNF levels are associated with better mood, lower levels are associated with worse mood, and levels rise with treatment. However, when we look at hormonally sensitive mood disorders, things get a little bit more complicated. In healthy menstruating women with normal mood, BDNF is found to be higher in the follicular phase than in the luteal phase. This is in contrast to the pattern that's seen in PMDD, where BDNF is higher in the luteal phase when mood is poor than in the follicular phase when mood is normal. And the relationship of BDNF to mood in perimenopausal depression has been very little studied. This study aimed to evaluate whether BDNF and, and inflammatory biomarkers can predict mood across the menstrual cycle in perimenopausal depression. In our study, blood samples were collected in the mid to late follicular cycle 
uh, defined as cycle days 5 to 15 and during the perimenstrual phase from the seven days prior to the first three days of menstruation, psychological assessments were completed concurrently. The biomarkers that were studied were BDNF, pro and anti-inflammatory cytokines, and the female gonadal hormones, estradiol and progesterone. The psychological assessments performed were the Montgomery Asperg, Asperg Depression Rating Scale, or MADRAS, and the Beck Depression Inventory from MOOD, the Kellner Symptom Questionnaire's Anger Hostility Subscale uh, to assess irritability, also called SQ, and the Profile of Mood States, or POMS, which assesses overall psychological distress. We then performed mixed, fixed, and random effects analysis, which was run separately for each of the dependent mood variables. Madras, BDI, SQ, and POMS. We analyzed specimens from 49 time points derived from 20 menstrual cycles. Menstrual cycles met criteria for inclusion if the cycle length was between 24 and 35 days, and if there was hormonal evidence of ovulation. Participants were 14 perimenopausal women ages 38 to 52 that were followed weekly for two months. We found a significant positive association between BDNF level and the affective variables, including mood, irritability, and overall psychological distress. No inflammatory biomarkers significantly predicted affective variables, and cycle phase did not affect the relationship between BDNF and mood. This figure shows the predicted psychiatric symptom severity by the variability in serum BDNF on the Montgomery Asperg Depression Rating Scale. On the x-axis is the, is the level of BDNF in the blood, and on the y-axis is the MADRA score, with higher numbers corresponding to worse mood, as shown by the blue arrow. The dark line shows the predicted depression severity. For every 1,000 picogram per milliliter increase in serum BDNF levels, the MADRA score increases by 0.5 points. Each of these unique colorful symbols represent individual subject level data. So any red dots you see belong to one participant, any green pluses you see belong to a different participant and so on. Each subject contributed at minimum two data points, one follicular and one perimenstrual, and up to six for those that had multiple follicular assessments or contributed two menstrual cycles to the study. This figure allows us to see both the individual data points and also the overall relationship between BDNF and mood. As you can see here, this relationship between BDNF and mood held true through all of the, the affective measures that were studied. This figure shows the predicted psychiatric symptom severity in the dark lines by the variability in serum BDNF on each of the affective measures that we looked at. The upper left shows the madras again for reference. On the upper right, you see the profile of mood states. On the lower left, the irritability symptom questionnaire. And on the lower right, the Beck depression inventory. As you can see, higher BDNF levels are associated with worse mood, greater irritability, and worse overall psychological distress. So in summary, we found that this cohort with, of women with perimenopausal depression, uh, BDNF is consistently elevated in association with more severe mood symptomatology. This is in contrast to the pattern that's seen in major depression in which mood tends to be low in association with worse mood. The temporal association of higher neurotrophin levels with worse mood in perimenopausal depression thus more closely resembles the pattern that's seen in premenstrual dysphoria, which is also hormonally sensitive. The higher BDNF um, that's seen with pre premenstrual dysphoria is thought to represent a compensatory mechanism for cellular stress, since stress responsive heat shock proteins track with the increased BDNF levels. Similarly, a compensatory mechanism could be at play here, although we don't have the data yet to say for sure. It's also possible that BDNF could behave differently in hormonally sensitive mood disorders than in non-hormonally sensitive mood disorders, since ster steroid hormones like estrogen and progesterone can impact BDNF levels. The BDNF gene contains a sequence um, that estrogen receptor complexes can bind to, and estrogen tends to increase BDNF levels in, in animal studies. Progesterone, too, may affect BDNF levels, and under some conditions, it appears to attenuate estrogen-mediated increases in BDNF levels. At perimenopause, estrogen levels can fluctuate dramatically, but progesterone levels are in decline. It may be that variations in the estrogen to progesterone ratio alter the pattern of BDNF production in relation to cellular insult, 
thus affecting the relationship of BDNF to Mu. Better understanding the underlying biology of reproductive subtypes of depression will be helpful for identifying new therapeutic avenues and for addressing non-responders to treatment. Research is a team effort, and I would like to thank Drs. Jaffe, Vicarova, Lacasio, and Silverspike for their mentorship and support, as well as Alita Wiley and Akanksha Srivastava for their support and their invaluable contributions. Um, that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions that come through the chat box. You did fantastic with timing. <laughs> Didn't need me to do the reminder at all. <laughs> yeah, so I welcome folks if you want to raise your hand. I can unmute you or put it in the, the, the chat. It was so interesting when I saw you, you had a perimenopausal as starting at age 38. That was, is that is that an age range that is uh, something yeah, that's already so, specified or? Yeah, so the, the age range for perimenopause varies considerably. The average age at which a woman enters the perimenopausal transition is about 48. Um, average age for menopause is 52. Um, and so that, that transition can, can take four years or, or more. Um, uh, but it, the underlying um, timing of when the woman enters menopause um, it depends on, on a number of different factors. Um, you know, genetics uh, play a role, and then, um, you know, there may be other, um, uh, you know, experiences that alter the rate of ovarian aging um, uh, individual by individual in effect um, when that transition begins for women. Yeah, we have a question for you, Dr. Harder. Um, yeah, neuro neurotrophic measure uh, factors can be can be measured in, in the bloodstream. Another question. Um, so yeah, so the question is, how would you change or enhance treatment in perimenopausal women with MDD to target this BDNF mechanism? You know, I think that we're um, we're not there yet with in terms of how uh, identifying how we can change therapeutics. I think we we need to uh, yeah. get a little bit more information about. Um, what the, the underlying mechanism is, you know, it, it's thought that SSRIs, um, which are our primary go-to treatment or first-line treatment for most cases of major depression, that part of how they exert their effect is by, um, is by a BDNF, driving up production. Um, and so if there's a, a differential response um, to those types of treatments, I think that would be helpful to understand. So looking at BDNF levels um, before and after SSRIs in, in, in perimenopausal and premenopausal women might <clears throat> just start to understand um, what, the response, what the response is, and then we might be able to start to think about uh, other ways. Um, but certainly, you know, there are um, hormonal treatments um, like giving hormone replacement therapy, uh, exogenous estrogen can treat perimenopausal depression in a way that it would not have any influence on uh, a major depressive disorder that wasn't in, uh, in that hormonally sensitive um, state. Um, so that, you know, exploring um, hormonal treatments that um, while, while mitigating the risks um, is, is another way that we could, another avenue to go down. Ooh, we have a question for about how do, I'm not, <laughs> Dr. Harder, this is another question for you. Yeah, yeah. So, so the question um, is how do serum or peripheral BDNF levels correlate to central tone and activity of BDNF? Um, yeah, I, I think that's a really good question. There are, um, you know, there are, there can be considerable fluctuations in terms of BDNF levels, you know, amongst the population, not just over the menstrual cycle, but um, but related to other other things as well. And I, um, I I haven't found a study that's a really good study that's looked at um, the tracking um, between you know what's what's being produced in the in the C, in the CSF or in the central nervous system um, where we would anticipate this would be directly having an impact on um, neural differentiation, neural connectedness, um, and what we're measuring in the serum. Um, but um, but there is a degree of correlation that's been established um, because this is um, ex accepted as as a as a as an approach to studying what's going on in the central nervous system. Um, we don't we don't have a, a kind of a, a one to one um, establishment of, of 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 that relationship. 
Well, um, give people just a few more seconds if you have any questions, but I'd also like to uh, remind everybody you know, the conversation doesn't stop here, it can, continues on. In fact, we have a whole rest of the day of Discover Brigham to enjoy. Um, and so I encourage all of our attendees to, oh, to, to do that. Um, so I just want to stop sharing. And so I just want to uh, highlight all of our speakers here. And uh, let's do it. And so I just want to thank all of, all of our Research Award winner poster presenters, uh, Dr. Bio, Dr. Grant, uh, Dr. Harder. Thank you so much for sharing your research today. Uh, you know, like I said, Discover Brigham, it's, it's almost like my, my New Year's, you know, like you get to celebrate all the research that's been taking place across the institution. Uh, and, but it, and coupled with, you know, all the stuff that we get to look forward to in the future, you know, it makes it so exciting. I appreciate your time today. And again, I, I encourage everybody, I think uh, postdoc, the, 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 the rock the pitch is, is up next. And uh, the, the video w will be made available at a later time for folks who didn't get to or uh, want to review it or want to see it again, you know, absolutely fascinating stuff. So again, thank you so much everybody for attending and enjoy the rest of Discover Brigham.